Um, it, it came out uh, about, what's it, two, end of March, and so I'd really encourage you to get that. This is a book that I've been wanting to write for a long, long time and put it in printed form uh, because it's just a message I, I know has been such a blessing to so many people. And then also there's a new a book called Living Grace. It was uh, published by New Nature Publications out of Hong Kong. And uh, I'm not the only author in this, but there are 13 different authors, Andrew, myself, um, uh, Rob Rufus, Ryan Rufus, um, Lucas Miles, uh, different people, John Crowder, and uh, really would encourage you to pick up this book. Um, they've done a great job of putting this book together by these 13 authors, um, and, and the reason we did it and the uh, goal behind it is what the, what the, the title says, Living Grace, how grace uh, allows us to live out what what God not only has promised but destined for us, and so um, I'd really encourage you to, to go and have a look uh, at our table for that book. Um, I know that wherever I go, that book seems to sell very well. Amen. Praise God. If you got your Bibles with you, turn with me in your Bibles there, and let's go to Ephesians uh, chapter three. Ephesians chapter three. I'd like to just read this passage of Scripture as uh, an introduction to uh, what I'm going to be ministering on. And I believe um, that really what the conference is going to be about and is about. Um, you know, Paul, writing to, to the church at Ephesus, in chapter 3, from verse, uh, verse 14, he says, For this cause... I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth of the length, the depth, and the height, and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Amen. Let's just pray. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you that your word uh, tonight, Lord Jesus, will manifest within us that Jesus, you, will bring forth revelation to each and every heart here tonight. Lord Jesus, that you would lead us step by step into a revelation of our true identity in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I'm sure that many of you will agree with me that uh, if you've been a Christian for any period of time, you would have noticed that a large majority of Christians, believers, tend to have an inaccurate understanding, not only of the Bible, but of who God is. And, you know, uh, and, uh, and, and again, this is not an accusation at all against anybody. It's just one of the things that I've noticed over the years that so many believers that I talk to seem to have this inaccurate understanding, not only of the Bible, but an inaccurate view of who God really is. Now, just as there is a grossly inaccurate understanding and concept in the hearts and minds of Christians about who God is, I also believe that there is an equally uh, inaccurate and destructive, crippling uh, view and belief in the hearts of many believers about who we are as human beings. And, you know, I've, I've, I know I've heard a lot of people teach, you know, on identity and that kind of stuff. But hopefully this week, in the times that I'm going to be with you, that we will be able to at least crack open that, that hidden uh, identity that 
I believe at the beginning, right in the garden, there has been a massive identity theft perpetrated on humanity. I truly believe that. And, you know, one of the things that, that I'm going to be sharing with you here, I really would ask you to, to allow your hearts and allow yourselves to be able to go and allow yourself to go. Because I, I see uh, so many Christians, because of what we've been taught and because of the way we've been instructed over the years and because of, of, of laid foundations over, over millennia, really, that so many people just don't allow themselves and allow their minds to go to where I would like to take you in this time. So how many of you are just going to allow yourself to go there? Before you judge, before you make a decision. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you. There's, somebody's excited at the back there. That's good. <laughs> you know, and you know, the thing that makes this uh, even worse is that how many of you understand that religion and legalism has absolutely no value for people? And religion and legalism, uh, by its very nature, destroys dignity, destroys worth, and destroys identity. Because religion and legalism really doesn't care about individuals. It doesn't care about people. It cares about a system. And, and you know, as long as, as the system is intact... It doesn't matter how many people it takes to keep that system intact. And, you know, and, and if people fall off, that's, that, that's okay. But as long as the system is right. You know, what you, all you have to do to see the destructiveness of what religion has done to the identity and worth of people, then all you have to do is travel as I have in many third world countries, uh, some of them very deeply religious countries, deeply uh, you know, uh, we, some people will call them spiritual countries or cultures. But if you go to some of the deeply religious cultures of the world, you will find some of the worst human tragedies perpetrated on humanity because of religion and because of what religion stands for. Now, let me just say, and, and, and in introduction, in to introducing this, uh, it's so important that we understand that unless we as, as believers, as men and women of God, unless we are taught, instructed in a proper sense of identity and self-worth. Now, I want you to listen carefully. Now, I know that many of you here, uh, you already know where I'm going with this. But I know that there are people here maybe this week, and uh, you've never heard me teach, you've never heard me preach. Uh, maybe people even on on the internet, on uh, you know, on the on the web, uh, what do they call it? Live streaming. Um, you 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 will hear some of the things that I say because I've had so many people that when I talk about you know teaching about self worth, immediately people, oh well, that's not just not Christian. Well, it's you know, here's the problem: is that's why you feel the way you feel. That's why you can't stand yourself. Come on now. And unless we are, and, and listen carefully the way I'm going to say this, because it's important that you go and understand. Now, I know that there are, there's some teaching that people teach, and it's more humanistic than anything else, but I want you to understand, unless we are taught and instructed in a proper biblical identity, self-worth, that is based upon the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we will seldom, if ever, experience God in an intimate and meaningful way. Boy, I tell you something, I find so many Christians, one of, the, one of the biggest things that I have to counsel with believers, that whenever I talk to them, whenever they come up with prayer, is that so many believers, they just don't experience God. They, they, they struggle to experience God and to experience Him in a meaningful, intimate way. And because of that, and I believe that the big reason is because that people are not instructed. And here's the thing that you've got to understand. Bible truths, 
the truths of the Bible. How many of you know that the Bible is full of truth? It, the gospel reveals the truth and takes the restrictions off truth. And, and in the gospel of Jesus Christ, there's so many powerful truths that are revealed not only for us, but to us. But here's the thing. Bible truth only works out of a heart that has confidence before God. I'm going to say this again. Bible truth only works best out of a heart that has confidence before God. You know, I can, I, you know, I can teach a lot about that, but I'm not going to go into that. You know, today, because of the influence in the church, in Christianity, of religion and legalism, most people have little or no confidence before God. You know, I tell you something, it, it, and, and again, uh, you know, I think it's because of uh, the nature of my ministry that I come in contact with people all the time, and I realize that there are so many believers, good men and women of God, who desire to experience God, and experience God in a, in a, in a meaningful, intimate way, and, 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 but they have no confidence before God because of the religious manner in which the gospel has been portrayed to them and the way that they believe in their hearts. You see, the views and the beliefs that many of us have held on to and that we believe, have believed in the past has um, gone us to a place actually where it has, has stripped us it has stripped us from a healthy biblical sense of our identity. Now listen carefully. Of your identity, of your humanity, and of your individuality. Boy, I'll tell you something. That is powerful. If you can understand that, listen, so many believers... The longer they are believers and the longer they stay in a religious legalistic system and they, and, and they try to serve God based upon a legalistic mindset, they are stripped slowly but surely of their identity, of their humanity, and of their individuality. A large, listen, a large majority of Christians today, if you talk, with Christians, and you ask many of many believers, and I'm not talking about peripheral believers. I'm talking about believers that are that you know that when you look at them, they 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 serious about God. They have a zeal for God. They have a zeal for the Word. They have a zeal for church. They have a zeal for the things of God. When you talk to them, one of the things that I found out is that very few of them actually even know what they like and dislike in life. They don't even know what it is they want to do. In fact, if, now they can tell you what they have been taught they should like. They can tell you what, what they should, they have been taught what they should be doing. But they themselves, within themselves, they don't know. They don't actually, they don't even know. Their lives are just like in limbo. They just seem to go through life and I'm just going from one day to the next. And that's why so many Christians can't wait for the by and by. One day, Jesus, please come and take me out of it. Because life is just not worth living. There's two people over there that know that I'm what I'm talking about. <laughs> Amen. You see, for so many people, being a Christian, a believer. Well, let me put it this way. For so many of us as believers, to be a believer and to be spiritual... You know, of course, there's believers, and then there are spiritual believers, right? I mean, there are those who are really spiritual. And so, for so many of us, as believers, to be spiritual is almost to be otherworldly. Now, what I mean by to be otherworldly means uh, it is, or, or, or let me put it this way, something other than human. Do you understand what I mean by that? That means that if you listen to the way that most believers believe a spiritual Christian should look like, 
then they don't even look like humans. They don't act like humans. Are you listening to what I'm saying here? And, you know, uh, in Christian circles, many Christian circles, for instance, so many of us have been encouraged over the years to, to deny your emotions. Deny your emotions. Deny your feelings. Because many, in many ways, a spiritual Christian or a spiritual believer is seen to be uh, somebody who denies actually and escapes. So, so what many of us have done is that I become a Christian and then when I'm a Christian, I actually am a Christian because Christianity is going to help me to, den- to deny and escape my humanity. And I tell you, sometimes you hang around some Christians and you talk to some Christians. Have you, have you been around some Christians that the way they talk and the things they say, and it's like you want to knock and say, are, are you human? <laughs> Amen. Are you human? I mean, is, is this making sense to anybody here? <laughs> Hallelujah. You see, I believe that if we correctly interpret the scriptures if we correctly interpret the gospel of Jesus Christ then the whole purpose for God in Genesis to create human beings was for the purpose of being human am I I I see some of you not you don't it's like I thought you're going to preach on grace I am Hallelujah. I'm busy. Because here's the thing though, is that, that, listen, the reason God created you a human being is for the reason to be human. God actually likes human. He created human. You know, I, I was think, I was think, if, Kathy, can you give me, just give me your, your iPad here. Just, yeah, just, it's fine. Now, you know, how many, you, you, I'm sure everybody is familiar with an iPad. Now, you know, the, crea- the creator of an iPad created the iPad to be an iPad. <laughs> now, you know, I saw, I saw an ad not so long ago about a, a, a young, it's, uh, and I'm not, can't remember exactly how the ad goes, but this is the, the gist of the ad. Is, it's a young lady who gave her aging father a present, and it was it was an iPad. And so she left the present for him where he could find it, and she wasn't able to be with him when he found the iPad. And so she calls him and says to him, Dad, did you find my present I gave you? And he said, oh, yes, thank you so much. It is a really great uh, presence. He, and he says, I'm busy using it right now. And she says, you are? And she's like, man, she's excited. man. I mean, he's actually using the iPad. But then you see him, he's busy talking to her and he's got the phone on and he's holding it like that and he's got the iPad and he's got some vegetables on it and he's got a knife and he's using it <laughs> as a cutting board. I thought it was Mike, actually. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> but you know, here's the thing though, is that, that we've got to understand the reason God created us humans is because, or human beings is for the purpose of being human. Now, in religion, the thing that we have to understand about religion and legalism is that the, a man's value and his worth is earned or is merited by good works and holy living. Amen. That's, that's what religion says. Religion says that your, your value is determined by good works and holy living. But here's, have, you ever, have, you, have you ever thought about this? Now, I know that nobody ever says it in so many words, but it is communicated to us in a subliminal way almost that, that if you're going to live a life of holiness and you're going to live a life 
uh, of good works, then that means abstain and deny almost anything and everything that has anything to do with being human. Amen, I'm going to preach over there because it's, it's quieter on this side. <laughs> you know, stay, I mean, stay away from anything that could be fun. I mean, if, I mean, if you're going to live a holy life and you're going to live a life of good work, then stay away from anything that could resemble fun. And, and, and please, don't have anything socially to do with other people in the world. Come on now. <laughs> you know, listen, because the majority of believers today... They struggle to make the connection between the passions and the dreams they have for their humanity. The passions and the dreams they have of being human. They struggle to connect that God could be connected to that. They struggle to, be, to believe that God in some way can be connected. You see, in, in the minds of so many people, in the hearts of so many believers today, being human and living and enjoying and doing life. You understand what I mean by doing life? You know, living life, doing life. The, those things that, that make, you know, a mother's heart just uh, within her swell for her children, those, those everyday human activities, human things that are important to us because we're human, we struggle to even understand that God would have anything to do with that. For many people, it is almost unthinkable that God would possibly be connected to or interested in our deepest human passions. You know, I want to go somewhere, but I don't know if you guys can handle it. You know? <laughs> Amen. We can't, we, can't, we can't even think. It's unthinkable to think that God could actually be interested and involved in my love life. That God could ever be involved in romance. It's quiet in this Presbyterian church right now. <laughs> that God could be involved in my love life in the point and to the point of the enjoyment of it. God forbid. You know, it's like, it's amazing to me. I think it was Caleb that said that he listened to somebody who was preaching and said, I know God's a man. And he said, well, how do you know God's a man? He says, because when he created Adam and Eve, the first thing he said was, go and procreate. <laughs> Amen. It's the first thing on his mind. You know? And, and, but, you know, here's the thing, though, is that, that it, it works into every other area of our life. Other areas of... how Would God even be interested in my aspirations towards a career. To so many Christians, God's not interested in that kind of stuff. He's interested in spiritual stuff. And I hope that this week, that as we go along and as I teach some of these things, that you can start to find yourself identifying where God is involved in every aspect of your humanness. You know, I, I just, I've never heard anybody teach on, on, on it this way that I'm doing it. So listen, if, if this is kind of uncomfortable for you, you know, just get used to it because I tell you what, God wants to be involved. God wants to be involved. You see, the passion and the enjoyment of life that every one of us have, I, I don't think there's a person here that does not have a deep down passion for life and enjoying life. And fulfillment in life. And fulfillment in every aspect of your life. 
And I'm not just talking about your career or in your art. You know, I, I think so many people don't even realize. You know, I think that years ago, thousands of years ago, some of the, some of the church fathers and some of the things that were done in, you know, in, the, in, in, in those ages gone by, some of the great artists that they were, I think they understood this. You know, I think that like Michelangelo, for instance, I think he understood. Even though he didn't know what you and I know today, I think he understood that the gift he had was a gift from God. And that God was impassionate in it. And he, everything he did, he did as to, unto God. Are you guys listening to what I'm saying here? Yeah. Amen. You see, it's only in God that the enjoyment and the fulfillment of being human can ever be fulfilled in your life. And I think so many Christians, so many men and women of God, they go through their Christian lives and because we, we, we tend to want to become something otherworldly instead of just being human and accepting. I mean, just think, I mean, how many of you will agree with me? You hang around some Christians and before you know, they will start apologizing for being human. They will. They'll say, well, you know, I'm, I'm sorry I, I, I did such and such and such, but I'm only human. As if you should be something else. No, I, are you, I, listen, I mean, that, that's the way we use it. Is that, well, just excuse me, I'm only human. Uh, I'm sorry that I couldn't be more than human. You were never created to be more than human. I hope this is helping somebody here. Amen. You see, because of our religious notions and ideas, we have become confused and we have become disconnected, as it were, from knowing, understanding, and relating to God based upon our true identity and our true worth and our, our true value that we have. And so what people are trying to do is that because we believe that, you see, I think that so many of us as Christians have somehow been taught that everything human is evil, weak, and unspiritual. Somehow we've been... And so what we do is we feel that just being, being human and having human emotions and having human feelings and having human aspirations is kind of unspiritual. And so we apologize because we would like to be something different. But God made us human. Amen? So here's, here's what I want you to get. Listen. The value of a human being is not earned or merited. But a man's value is something that is intrinsic and assigned to you and belongs to you purely because that's the way God made you. For no other reason. You have intrinsic value with God purely because that's the way He made you. Why? Because man and, and, and His value and His worth is because God made you the uh, I would say God's ultimate uh, crowning creation. I think that's the way that Andrew said it yesterday. You are God's ultimate crowning creation. And if you can understand that, then what, when you look at Jesus, when you look at the New Testament, then, then being a spiritual believer, a Christian, is not about denying your humanity, but it's about Coming and partaking of the Zoe life of God and then distributing and actually living out and expressing that life in your humanity. That means in, 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 in every aspect of your humanness, God wants you to partake of His life, of His uh, 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 intimacy, of His 
a life between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and partake of that. Become not a spectator to it, but become a partaker of it. And, and as you are, in your human, everyday humanness, you can now express that life, that love, the forgiveness, the transparency, the, the, the oneness of the Father. You can express that in every area of your life. Turn with me in your Bibles here. And you know, that's why John said, uh, turn with me to, to, to uh, Psalm 8. Psalm 8. But um, that's why John 10 verse 10. John chapter 10 and verse 10. Where Jesus said, the thief comes in order to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come that you might have life and life more abundantly. Now, you know, I know that many of you know this. But uh, and I don't have time to teach on it. But if you go and study that whole passage of Scripture from verse 1, you'll see that, that the thief is not. Now, the, the devil is a thief. How many of you understand that? But in that passage of Scripture, it's not talking about the devil. It's talking about religion. And if you, if, you, if you read through it and study it from verse 1, you'll see he makes it very clear. And he talks about that there is, that there is another trying to get into the sheepfold another way, except through the door, which is Jesus. Now, that's religion. And he's saying, now, this, this religion is the thief that comes to steal, kill, and to destroy. Hallelujah. But I have come that you might have life, and life more abundantly. Now, let's go there to, to uh, Psalm 8. And um, I'm going to start reading there from... Verse 1, it says, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who has set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, thou hast ordained strength because of your enemies, and thou hast, uh, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. Now, listen carefully to, I wish I had time to even start teaching from verse 1 and verse 2, but listen to what he's saying here. He says, now this is how uh, uh, you'll steal the enemy. He says, that so that you might steal the enemy. He says, when I consider thy heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? Two questions. David asked these two questions. I truly believe that these two questions are still being asked by most people today. They might not be asking them exactly this way, but these two questions have been asked. Who is man? Because David is, I mean, he's looking at this whole deal and he's saying, listen, when I consider your heavens, when I consider the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars... When I look at it, now, I don't know about you guys, but I have, and I grew up, my dad used to always teach me to go lie down on, uh, at night on, on, the, on the, the grass and just look at the sky. And he would, he would, you know, he knew a little bit about the, the night sky and, and he would show me the Southern Cross and he would show me all the Orion's Belt and, you know, the whole deal and, and, and just the, the Milky Way. And I've always been fascinated by that. I'm, I'm, we even did it with our kids. And, and Kathy and I, every time we go back to South Africa, the Southern sky seems to be just so much more um, alive. Uh, maybe, maybe it's because every time I've looked at the sky here in America, I've been in a big city and light pollution and that kind of stuff. But, you know, back in, in the southern hemisphere, there's just this beautiful, beautiful, um, uh, the Milky Way, you know. And so we could look at it. We can see the, the different um, satellites coming over and that kind of stuff. But, you know, what David is saying is, you know, David was a, a shepherd boy. He must have spent many, many a night laying in, you know, on his back, you know, going to sleep at night, looking after the sheep and looking at the sky. He must have thought to himself, how beautiful, how big, how majestic. And he says, he says, Lord, when, when I look at your creation, when I look at what you've created, the size of it, the magnitude of it, the beauty of it, I mean, almost, there's this, this guy, what's his name, uh, uh, Giglio. 
Anybody? In the, huh? Lou, is it Louis? Louis, Louis Giglio? I, you listen to some of the things that he comes out with and that he can show you that, you know, science has been discovering about our universe and about our, the cosmos. It's mind-boggling. The size. Light, I mean, some millions of light years apart. I mean, the, I, my mind doesn't even com- compute any of that. And this is what he says. David says, when I look at that, then who is man? And really, what he's saying is, we, are, we seem to be so insignificant. Now, I think even today, that is still the idea that evolutionists have. They look at the size of creation. They look at the magnitude. They look at the, com- the complex uh, uh, way in which the whole universe is put together. And then they look at, at ourselves. They look at you and they look at me and they say, Oh, well, from good to you by way of the zoo. You know, this is this just kind of... Because we think that we're a result, that we are a result of the creation. Or let me put it this way. So many people still think, and so many of us as believers still think that we're kind of an add-on to creation. Are you guys here with me here? Man, I'll tell you something. When we start to look, who is man? And, and people are still asking that question. Now, the way that Christians have asked and answered this question in the past, the way that we've dealt with this. See, listen, the way you answer this question in your belief system here is the way that you're going to deal with other people around you. It's the way that you're going to be ministering. It's the way that you're going to uh, be seeing the people around you, the way that you relate to the people around you and the world around you. Depending on how you will answer this question asked, who is man? Now, let me just give you some of the things that we as believers have, how we've answered this. What we've done with this question is that we've said to people, and we said to the world, maybe, maybe again, maybe not in so many words, but we've communicated this as the church, as Christians. We've communicated to the rest of the world that you have no value to God unless you get saved. And so what, what we do is we minister from that understanding. And so whenever we, we come across somebody who's in the world, who's never accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, so then we approach them and, and we approach them from this. God has no value for you as a human being unless you get saved. And so what they do, they get saved. Then we tell them, you have no value to God. Unless you can do right, live right, and be right. I know that none of you have ever experienced that. See, listen, religion and legalism says performance is equal to acceptance. So, listen, no human being, say it with me, no human being, no human being can live and experience God in an intimate, meaningful way if performance determines your value. Now, I know that, you know, some of the things I'm saying are so fundamental, but I know where I'm going with this. So stick with me. Listen, performance that equals value, the premise there is rejection and not acceptance. So, It means you start out your relationship with God based upon rejection, not acceptance. A large majority of Christian organizations, evangelism people that go out in the world, approach the world with that mindset. And they approach people from you are rejected. You're not, 
Now, I'm going to have a look at the scripture and I'm going to bring some scriptures out there, but it's important. See, the premise is rejection. And, and, and so you're unacceptable unless you will, you will do a certain thing or live up to a certain standard or, you know, uh, prescribe to a certain law. Therefore, under religion, a person's relationship with God starts, first of all, with separation, rejection, exclusion, with no way of gaining love and acceptance. Because the ways that we give people to say, this is going to give you acceptance, nobody can do it. Amen. Now, let's go further then in... in, in uh, in Psalm 8, and I'm going to read out of the Amplified Bible. Listen to what the Amplified Bible says. Man, I love this. He says, Psalm 8, he says, when I, when I view and consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have ordained, and you've established, that uh, what is man that you are mindful of him? Just, just think about those words. David says, what is man, God, that your mind is filled with thoughts about him? Oh, come on now. No, I, I, I mean, I, I wasn't going to stop there, but, I, I, but it's important. That's what David is saying. David says, when I look at everything else. See, what we do is we look... How many Christians have you not heard and said, but I don't know if God's going to hear me because I, because I feel and I think that He's got more important things to do. Hello. We think that somehow we're just an add-on to this whole deal. And I want to show you as we go along that we're not the add-on. We're the reason. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. He says... How is it, God, when I see the creation and I see that when I look at man, it looks so insignificant, but yet, what blows my mind, God, if he was speaking our language, he would say that your mind is filled with thoughts about him. And you know, Jeremiah told us what those thoughts are. Thoughts of good and not of evil. Thoughts to give you not just an expected end, but that he has got, I love the Amplified said that I have not only uh, thoughts about you, but plans for, can you, I mean, God's got plans for me. I don't know about you. See, there was a long time in my Christian walk and in my Christianity that I thought that God never thought about me. And if he did think about me, the, think, the thought he was going to think is how he's going to kill me. Amen. Hallelujah. No, no, notice he goes on here and he says, he says, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man that thou, uh, or, and I love the way that this is put, earth born man. Now in the, in the Hebrew, the Hebrew words he used here for man is the word Adam. Adam in Hebrew, not Adam, but Adam. Adam, literally, I, I, the reason I got this out here, I wrote this in my Bible here. This word that he used, who is man that thou art mindful of? And the son of Adam that thou visitest him. Those, this is what it means. For uh, uh, miserable, wretched, fallen man. I don't know if you get this. See, David's not talking here about you know, a man that's just all that. He's talking about, what is it, God, that your mind is filled with thoughts about wretched, fallen, miserable, Adam the traitor? <laughs> now, I don't know about you guys, but if he, David here is saying, I am bamboozled, God, that you would even think about this fallen man. And then he turns around immediately, and it's as David, it's David comes, it's like, oh yeah, that's right. What's he say? He says, uh, the next verse, yet you have made him a little lower than Elohim. The Amplified here says, little lower than God. 
No, 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 she, hang on. You, you didn't get this because I can see some of you didn't get this. Who's he talking about? Fallen man. He's talking about Adam, the wretched, miserable fallen man. And he says, not only is your mind full, he says, oh yes, that's right. You have made this wretched, fallen, miserable, traitor of a man just a little lower than God himself. I don't know if you guys, I don't, some of you are just not getting this. Amen. See, listen, before we can ever understand who we are in Christ Jesus as believers, we first of all have to understand where our origin is from and understand how God sees you before you ever accept Jesus Christ. Man, I tell you, if you if you if you go through that, he's saying, "Listen, thou hast made him just a little lower than Elohim." That that the the Hebrew there, the Hebrew language has the capacity to assign a time verb, as it were, to it. It's it's time connected. That means if you read it in the Hebrew, it sounds like this: "For you have made." Wretched, miserable Adam, just a little lower for a period of time than God. So what's it talking about? He's saying this is only, this is only a period. This is only uh, something that's not going to last. He said to me, oh, well, what, what's going to happen there? Listen, you've got to understand is that even as a wretched fallen man, you never became anything else than a God being. Even when Adam fell and man was in its fallen state, you did not become some other creature. You, mankind has always been God beings. I mean, just, you know, in, 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 in Bible school, I teach a class called Who is Man? And, and basically what I say to the students is this. Do you realize, do you understand that when God created Adam in the beginning, when he created that man, he made that man 100% compatible with God? Why? Because he knew God would have to come and become a man one day. Uh, you know, just it's, it's like somebody said to me one time, and I, I never got it until just recently, realizing, listen, if, if, if you're a creator, and you're, you know, an inventor, and you're going to create something that, will, that, that you're going to be uh, uh, part of for the rest of your life, won't you make it absolutely 100% compatible with you? Or will you make it less compatible? Now, I want you to listen to this because you've got to understand that when Jesus came in the incarnation, hello, the Bible says he became a human being. He didn't, listen, he didn't act as if he is a human being. He actually became a human being. And that human being, Jesus in his humanness, was 100% compatible with who God is. Oh, come on now. Now, I don't want to run ahead of myself here, but can I, can I go to some other scriptures here quickly? Okay, just, I, I, because really, this tonight, I'm just really trying to set some parameters, because where I'm going to go, if I don't, if I don't lay this foundation, you're going to have no foundation to go with. So here's a, John chapter 3 and verse 16. We all know that verse, right? Amen. Okay, well, I'm going to read it. It says, For God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world. Everybody say, the world. Okay, so, so when, when, when John writes here and he uses the term the world, what's he referring to? Come on now. Does he, is he referring to this planet Earth? No, what's he referring to? Men or people? He's talking about people or human beings. I'd like to maybe people or human beings. 
Now here's what we're going to get. I want you to listen carefully. He says, for God so... Amplified said, greatly loved the world that He even gave up, uh, gave up His only begotten unique Son. So that whosoever believes in, trusts in, clings to, relies on Him, shall not perish, come to destruction, be lost, but have eternal, everlasting life. Okay, now here's... The way that we communicate the gospel is that you, and again, it's, it's maybe not in the, the, the so many words, but this is the way that most people, God had such a problem with man that he sent his only begotten son. Now, I mean, if God, listen, if God had a problem with man, or if man was a problem to God, then shouldn't that verse read, for God had such a problem with man? That he sent his only begotten son. But yet, yet the way that we preach it is that God had such a problem. He had such a problem and man was such a problem to God that he had to come and do something about man. No, no, no. This scripture says, for God so greatly loved man that he sent his only begotten son. See, I want you to understand. Now, I know that this is radical for some people. Uh, and some people on the internet, or who, and maybe you here, this might be radical to you, but I want you to understand, God has never had a problem with man. Now, he's had a problem with sin, but he's never had a problem with man. Man has never been God's problem. Sin was a problem. Sin was what God hated. And Jesus came and when he died on that cross the bible says he became our sin and god's wrath poured upon jesus was not god punishing man it was god dealing with sin now if God had to deal with sin in your body, then you would just be destroyed. And that's why Jesus had to come. And sin had to be dealt in His body so that you would be saved. Hallelujah. Amen. This is awesome. You know, Luke, and I'm, I'm almost done here. Luke chapter 4 and verse 18 through to verse 19. This is, and we know these verses. Jesus being baptized in the Holy Spirit, and uh, the Father spoke out of heaven, and sonship was conferred upon Jesus in front of not just the most important prophet, but the most important man that ever lived, John the Baptist. And Jesus said that. He said, there's no man born of a woman greater than John the Baptist. And he says, and so he gets baptized in the Holy Spirit. God the Father speaks and declares sonship upon Jesus. Jesus goes into the wilderness and then comes back. And notice he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. And I love the Amplified. It says he has anointed me, the anointed one, the Messiah, to preach the good news gospel to the poor, he has sent me to announce release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set forth as delivered those who are oppressed, who are trodden down, bruised, crushed, and broken down by calamity. Now verse 18. To preach the accepted and acceptable year of the Lord. Now here's, <laughs> I want you to see this. Here Jesus comes, and in that verse 19, in the original language, He says, I'm coming to preach and to declare to you the age. The here, there's not year, like, you know, like we know the here. It's the age. I am coming, and I am proclaiming the age of God's acceptance. Amen. What's He saying? He's saying, I'm coming to 
preach a gospel to you, not of separation, not of, 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 of um, what's the other word I used? Help me somebody. Rejection or separation or to be alienated. I've not come to preach and give you a message that you're alienated. I've come to preach a message to say to you, you're accepted. The age of God's acceptance. See, this is the reality of God's love demonstrated in the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, <clears throat> we talk about grace and the gospel of grace, but you understand that it's just the gospel. Grace is just the go- it's the gospel. Amen. Now, you, we, we, we define it, you know, as grace and the grace message, but it's the gospel, brother and sister. And, and what we can understand is that in the gospel of Jesus Christ, what is demonstrated to you and me through Jesus and what he did is that we are loved, valued, and we are worth something to God. Hallelujah. You know, Romans chapter 5, I'm going to read this to you out of the J.B. Phillips translation, and this is what it says. Romans chapter 5 verse 6 says, And we can see that it was while we were powerless to help ourselves that Christ died for sinful men. I think the, the King James says that Christ died for the ungodly. I don't know. I don't, somehow, somewhere, we've kind of missed this whole deal because we t- we tend to think that you know Jesus. No, he came and died for the ungodly, the sinful men. He says, in human experience, it is a rare thing for one man to give his life for another, even if the latter be a good man. He says, though there have been a few who have had the courage to do so, yet the proof of God's amazing love is this. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know, Titus. I'm just going to read a couple of verses here. Titus says this. He says in Titus chapter 3 and verse 4, he says, But after that the kindness and love of our Savior toward men appeared. I mean, just listen to that. It, It doesn't say after the kindness and love of God our Savior towards believers appeared toward men how many men all men all men he says not of works of righteousness which we have done but according to his mercy (laughs) according to his mercy say with me mercy. mercy he saved you By the washing of regeneration, the renewing of the Holy Spirit. I don't know about you guys, but that doesn't sound like a God who has no value for people. That doesn't sound like a God who has no value for, for, for un- unbelievers, if you want to put it this way. You know, uh, the important thing about this is, and I'm going to close with this. The awesome reality of the gospel of Jesus Christ is this, and, and, and this is where we'll go the, next, the rest of the week in my teaching. The redemption and salvation that we have in Christ Jesus is that God loved and had value for the whole world, all of humanity, so much so that no matter if they will accept it or not, Jesus would die for their sins and pay the full price for their redemption whether they receive it or not God has done everything everything necessary to produce the results needed for all of men's redemption and their union in the identity of Jesus Christ now, you know, I, I know that to many of us, 
This messes with our theology. It messes with our minds. But here's what you've got to understand. And I, I've said it and I will say it over and over again. You've got to get it. If Jesus did not do this for all of humanity, he did it for no man. If he didn't do it for all of humanity, then he didn't do it for you. The only way that you and I could be a partaker of what he did is he had to do it for every man. And he had to pay the price for every man. Amen. See, in the gospel of Jesus Christ, God has expressed, and he is expressing, because I believe it's an ongoing expression of God. He is expressing his profound unwillingness to do without you. I'm going to say it again. You've got to get it. Through the gospel of Jesus Christ, God is expressing, and he has expressed, and he is expressing right now. He is expressing his profound unwillingness to do without man, without you. That's what this gospel is about. This is God's profound no. You're not going to perish. Come on now. <laughs> it's his profound no expressing his unwillingness to do without you. Therefore, he came in his, in his purposes, eternal purposes. He came in Christ and 100% united himself with mankind. And he became a human being. You know, of course, that at the right hand of God, right this minute, is a human being. And he will always be a human being. And forever and in eternity, you and I will be equated with that second person of the Godhead. A human being. Hallelujah. Man, I tell you something. When we can understand that, grab a hold of that. It becomes, and, and what we'll do in, the, in my next sessions as we go along, we will start to explore some of these things and look at, you know, listen, this is the way God saw us before we were saved, before you accepted Jesus Christ, before you even knew about it. He, this is how he saw you. Now, here's the thing. If David says, thou hast crowned him with dignity and worth. Who was crowned with dignity and worth? Adam, wretched, fallen, terrible, traitor of a man, crowned with dignity and worth. Now that you're a redeemed man, now that you've received redemption, now that you, can you understand? I mean, to me, it's like, you know what? We can't even imagine. We can't. I don't, I, it goes beyond our understanding, beyond our imagination, because what's happened in the 6,000 years since Adam, the devil has perpetrated identity theft and has stolen our identity. And most of us have no clue who we really are. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, I tell you, when you understand like Zacchaeus. Nothing is more uh, illustrated, better illustrated than the story of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus said, the Bible, if you go read it, and my paraphrase would be, Zacchaeus said to himself, I hear that Jesus is coming, and I'm going to go, at least I can see him. And who was, he, who was Zacchaeus? The Bible says he was a publican. In fact, the Bible says not only was he public, he was the head publican. He, was, he wasn't just an ordinary publican. He was the head publican. He was the chief. The Amplified Bible calls, when it talks about publicans, especially wicked sinners. So Zacchaeus goes and he says, you know what? I'm at least going to be able to go say, I saw Jesus. Because all that he could muster in his heart was that maybe I, all I could see is I could see Jesus. But he was a short man, so when he went to go and have a look where Jesus is passing by, the other people that were, were standing, they couldn't, he couldn't see. So, you know, he had short man syndrome, and they always come up with ingenious ideas. And so he, he, climbs, up, he climbs up 
uh, you know, on, in the sycamore tree, and he sits in the sycamore tree, and, and it says there, you go read it, it says, and he sat there, at least he can see Jesus passing him by. I mean, what, what he's saying is, I, all I can expect, because I'm a publican, I am the wickedest of wickedest sinners. I am the, 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 the worst of the worst. The dregs of the earth. All I can do is I can see Jesus pass me by. Who is Jesus? He's salvation. And all he could expect was, I can just expect it passing me by. But the Bible tells us, when Jesus got to where Zacchaeus was in the tree, Jesus stopped. Jesus stopped. And Jesus said to him, Zacchaeus. I always tell people, it's a wonder he didn't fall out the tree. (laughs) It's a wonder he didn't just come tumbling right out of the tree. Because I think that if that was me, I most probably would have fallen right out of that tree. But he said, Zacchaeus. He knows my name. He knows my name. All he could expect was, oh, Jesus is going to pass me by. I can at least say to my children, I saw Jesus. But Jesus knew his name. And then Jesus says, today, I'm coming to have dinner at your house. And the Bible says, he clambered down the tree. And watch what happens. Immediately, he says to Jesus, Jesus, Today, I will give back half of my goods. I will give to the poor. And if I have stolen anything from anybody, I'm going to give them four times. Now, let me just ask you this. Do you think that when Zacchaeus woke up that morning, he got out of bed, stretched himself and said, I think today I'm going to give half my goods to the poor. And I'm going to give back four times to those I've stolen from. Do you think that do you think that was his intention? That was the last thing on his mind. But guess what happened? When 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 Jesus knew his name and said today I'm coming to have lunch <laughs> at your house. Amen. That man changed. Why? Because Jesus saw value in Zacchaeus. That he didn't even see in himself. And what did he do? And Je- now I want you to do this. You can go and read this. And this is what Jesus said. Now you know, I used to read this over and over. I mean, I've read those verses so many times. I've taught on it. I never saw it. Jesus said this. He said, today, salvation has come to this house I see some of you say well what does that mean this is what it means it does not say today this house came to salvation he says today salvation came to the house see we preach a gospel that you need to come to the salvation when the gospel of Jesus Christ is salvation has come to you that's why this is come on now salvation has come to you god has come to you see people say well i gotta seek no god came and sought you out you don't find god he found you Mm, hallelujah man when we start to grab a hold of this and understand this and realize then you're going to realize that god's work in christ goes way further than you ever even imagined. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Let's pray. Father.